Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sultan Sharif. I uh, am a filmmaker. Uh, I'm a first year student in the CMS uh, program. And uh, yeah, I kind of have a crazy, a wild sort of all over the place meta background. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and, uh, and some of the projects that sort of helped me get my career started. And, and then some of the projects I'm desperately trying to finish while also focusing on my CMS work. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so to start off, I, um, I, I kind of had a really crazy background. I, uh, I have eight siblings. I grew up in the, um, I'm second generation black Muslim. So like my dad converted with like Malcolm X's brother. So like imagine, imagine having Malcolm X for a dad, like that's kind of how I grew up. Uh, my parents are <laughs> really strict. Um, they converted from the Nation of Islam to traditional Sunni Islam. And so, um, but my dad had lots of, uh, he was like a mini preacher. And so we grew up getting lectures about the black man and what the black man was supposed to do and what the white man was doing and um, lots of things uh, sort of structured around that. But at any moment he could break out into a, a long dis description of how like uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears was a, was a symb symbolic way for like the, uh, to represent a young white woman overtaking like three large black men. And so he'd have all these theories of things like that. And so we grew up hearing that and just basically hating, hating all of his lectures. And then as I started to get older, I started kind of realizing that there was some, some interesting truth in them. And so that shaped a lot of my um, perspective as a filmmaker, as an artist. And um, so I'm kind of going to jump between personal life stories and uh, narrative. So, um, and some of you have seen some of these slides who, if you came to the initial presentation uh, for CMS. So yeah, I do a lot of things. Um, I am a filmmaker. I'm on the board of the Michigan Theater. It's a historic art house theater in Ann Arbor. Um, but we run what's called the Art House Convergence, which is a conference of independent theaters around the country. It got started as something called the Sundance Art House Project. So it's basically working with the Sundance Institute to um, support independent art house theaters to help them stay competitive in like the new digital area era. So we're in like year 12 now of the conference. So it started around 06. It's grown to about, um, I want to say about 500. Last year we had 620 participants, but they were representing about 500 theaters, um, about 100 distributors, and then uh, various like filmmakers and film festivals are mixed in into that as well. So. Um, and then uh, I do a lot of social, social impact work. I've been running a youth program in Detroit for about 10 years. It was actually my undergrad thesis project that became my company, essentially, and, uh, and a youth program. And then uh, I do ice carving occasionally. I play rugby. Um, and then I do public speaking a lot um, with my taking my film that I made. Um, I'm really big on perspective and just uh, thinking about like how we're seeing things. I always, with my students, they, they call it, we call our design meta design, because it's always like, can I zoom out more? Like, if everybody's looking at this thing, like, can I step back and take a look at the people who are looking at it? And what does that look like? Um, and so, uh, so I always feel like for so many of the social issues, and, and I'd say most of my work is, is focused long term on how to, how to close the achievement gap, and um, predominantly like in American schools, but also um, worldwide and really focus on in empowering inner city youth, empowering youth of color, um, and uh, addressing, trying to find ways to promote greater social mobility. Um, so I think that's my end all be all. Uh, I grew up in, a, um, I won't bore you with my Forrest Gump-like upbringing, but uh, I'll just say I ha went through a lot of rough patches with my family back and forth. Um, when I was 13, I actually lived on my own. Um, for a, almost a year with my brother. Um, and uh, we were borderline homeless, but we crashed in this old abandoned house. And it's a long story, but it shaped a lot of my perspective on the world, on privilege, on, um, on access, and, uh, and sort of services that we have in the, um, that we have, you know, that the way that people see young people, uh, inner city youth in particular, and like how they see themselves. Um, and so, after that, things got better, moved back in with my mom, and then uh, sort of had more of a traditional high school experience after that. Um, and so I went through high school, then went to, got into the University of Michigan. Um, I basically, after having been completely outside of the existing system, um, so I basically didn't go to the seventh grade, I just worked for a year um, as, a, as a, a dishwasher. 
And so once I got back into school, I like wanted to do everything. And so I wanted to take every class. I had never played a sport. I had never played an instrument. I just wanted to do some of everything. And so I did. That's how I got into ice carving. And so uh, eventually went to the University of Michigan. And, um, and then I got there and I had this sort of re reverse culture shock where I felt like um, we, growing up, we had sort of been sold a lie. Like we had been taught the world was one thing and we had been taught that we were a certain thing sort of fitting into these structures. And then I got there and I remember questioning my freshman year roommate, who I'm still really good friends with, um, trying to figure out like, how did he get into the University of Michigan? Like what, what is his miraculous story? Because I knew I had had this sort of crazy journey and overcome all these obstacles. Like what did he do to sort of earn his spot here? And he just was a regular kid from the suburbs. His mom went to U of M, his dad went to U of M, his older sister had just graduated from U of M. So he just kind of like went with the flow and ended up in this place. Whereas where I had come from, I felt like if you weren't sort of desperately clawing at this future that you wanted to see, then um, you wouldn't get there. So initially I was actually pre-med and undergrad and then I, uh, went to sociology because I was like, maybe that's where you figure out how to address these issues. But then in sociology, I started reading books and there were books describing what I had experienced growing up. And I was like, I thought that people just didn't understand. Like when I was going through those things, I thought nobody knew. I thought that um, maybe somehow like I was the first one going through. And then so more and more I started realizing, actually, this is a regular thing that happens all over the place. And there are theses and books. And so if, if these people know that this is happening, how is it that I was still experiencing it and kids that I work with are still experiencing it every day? Like, why isn't there some intervention process? And then moreover, like, what um, we were joking around yesterday, I was, I was the poor kid in the group of poor kids. I was the kid who was sort of teased the most. And, uh, and so I started thinking a lot about the, um, the sort of cultural aspects between growing up in an inner city environment uh, where like the clothes you wear, the, the style of dress you have, et cetera, versus like more of a middle class environment um, sort of shapes your, your ide identity. It shapes your perspective on the world. So through all of those experiences and, and wanting to sort of change statistics like this, I got into film. And so I, I came into film as an answer to the question of like, how can we change the system? It wasn't that, I mean, I, I felt an affinity for the creative aspects, but it was a mission for me. It was, I am going to try to address this system so that kids don't have to go through what I went through. And so, and what is the most practical way to do it if it's not sociology, if it's not medical school, if it's not, um, you know, sort of political aspect, I felt like changing the media and creating change within the young people themselves. So instead of looking at the system, looking at young people and saying, there's enough of us out there that if we change, create change within ourselves, then that's enough to shape the world around us as opposed to going the other way around. So um, I kind of initially studied third cinema um, and, and I, oppositional cinema and uh, ways to um, sort of movements to when you make cinema to um, sort of countering first cinema, which is sort of Hollywood, second cinema being like avant-garde uh, and French New Wave, and then third cinema being this thing where you acknowledge who you are and you acknowledge what your limitations are, and then you make that part of the substance of what you're doing. And so, uh, so there's a lot of sort of high level design. And I wrote a story that was based on my experiences and a tiny chapter of some of the struggles that I went through trying to get to college um, called Bilal Stan. Uh, and then we designed a youth program where we would partner because I was like, we, it wouldn't be enough to just tell a story. Like we have to change the narrative of the system as we're telling the story. It needs to be built in to the model. So we designed a program where we would partner with inner city youth. We would bring them onto campus at the University of Michigan. They would actually take classes for six weeks on, class, or on campus with the college students. Then after a six week class on community filmmaking where we taught them theories of third cinema, um, and oppositional cinema, and we, we read about, we read like D.O.R., we read about the feminine gaze, we like went through all of these, these ideas um, as we workshopped the script. And then, um, and then through that process, at the end of it, we were like, okay, now we're ready to make the film. So here is a video that um, my students actually made. So part of it was also, uh, it wasn't just about, we were trying to challenge the sort of auteur model and saying, yeah, I have experiences and might, I might be able to write from them, but like, what do, what might young people think about those same things? So my students made this video about our program. This is pre-HD, this is mini DV, so. <laughs>
This film project grew out of a desire to engage and empower the youth of inner city community through the art of filmmaking. Twelve University of Michigan students were selected to pair with twelve students from the Metro Detroit community to learn about, plan, and help shoot a feature film. And I was real interested in it because my class don't like to participate for me. Not much, but you know, I'm like real interested in multimedia, so I'm like, okay. And I thought it'd be a good experience. The students attended several workshops with working professionals, including screenwriter Jim Bernstein, Broadway actress and university professor Janet Maley, yeah, and independent filmmakers Rob Hess and Steve Copra. After these lessons, the students were given assignments to produce and direct TV shows and scenes from the film. What you mean, what am I going to do? What are we going to do? And then we can cut to a different angle or something like that, you know? Oh, we can play. Like, getting like a better respect for actors. Why is that? Uh, because I had to know the lines, had to have the emotions, had to do everything the way the director wanted it to be done. We shot for six weeks on a shoestring budget, but for the most part, everything worked out. Mm -hmm. Wow, look, so it's morning. He's been studying all night. Uh, Action. The students all volunteered their time and worked 12 hours, sometimes 15 hours, to make sure that we got all of our shots got everything we needed to make the film a success. The dynamics of our group were always interesting because there were so many people from different backgrounds and we were spending almost 80 hours a week together. In the end, we all ended up learning a lot about each other. Where do you get that kind of money from? I'm a baller, Angie. Don't worry about it. We'll say boss up. Boss up? <laughs> Some of the actors had never acted before. Look, look just say, how do you want to hear And others had over 15 years of experience. Uh, we enlisted the help of a local popular radio station, FM 98 WJLB in Detroit, to help promote the film and serve as a way to engage the community in the process of making the film. Dr. Darius, the DJ at WJLB, was really eager to get involved in the project. Little fellas over here, how do y'all get 14? 14. 14 years old. You hold the, the boom mic. Yeah. How was that, man? Don't your arms get tired? Yeah. Like, they always get tired in the end. They be falling asleep. I be wiggling it, but I gotta make sure I keep it straight so I can uh, keep the same sound. So on the movie, it'll sound good and it won't be uh, going from a high to low pitch and stuff. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. Oh, God, that's all right. Oh, that's all right. Okay. We also made sure to keep the community involved in the making of the film so that the message of the film to encourage young people to take positive steps towards their goals could be taught through process as well as product. I think it's educational too, and like I said, I'm glad you're getting the whole community involved. Not just one area, because a lot of times when you're shooting film, it's just one area, and if you're not in theater or acting, you can't get a part. But one good thing about my last stand is they have gotten the whole community involved. And that's what so, this uh, one of the things that was really important to us was to sort of stay in line with our values. So we actually started shooting the feature film without enough money to finish. And the night before we started shooting, we, when there's funding, there's, there's a whole behind the scenes thing where they interview me that night. And uh, we were like, we're making a story about a kid trying to get to college and it's a scary, dangerous endeavor. So who would we be to say, we're gonna tell this story about a certain thing without putting ourselves in the same situation as the character of the story that we're trying to tell. So we, we were like, if, if we're trying to send a message that says you have to be bold, you have to believe in yourself, you have to follow your dreams, and we need to do that as we're making this film. So we just started shooting. <laughs> With, we, had, we had raised uh, about um, $12,000 in cash, and uh, we, so we had enough money to get through like, ha like mostly the first week. And then we designed our program in a way where we, our students would, um, not only were they directing scenes, but we taught them all the aspects of filmmaking. So I taught all my students how to give a business pitch, and then they would go out to businesses in Ann Arbor and Detroit, and they would pitch to them about the film to get food donated for the film. So, uh, so we ended up creating these interesting partnerships where there's a scene we shot at the church, for example, where the church did a huge, they normally did a huge cook-off, right? So they did a cook-off for us, they um, brought about 100 extras that we needed for a funeral scene. So they called the guy who normally does flowers or funerals and he brought a bunch of flowers that were left over from a previous, uh, from like a previous funeral setup. And then he gave us a coffin that they used for, uh, that was like one of their model 
old models that wasn't going to be on the display thing anymore. And so then they then turned around, they're actually a historic church that was a, one of the final stops of the Underground Railroad. So then they turned around and used our film shoot as an educational exercise for their community. So it was like, come be in a film. So we actually built elements of the film shoot around their church so that they were hosting an event that was really cool for their patrons. And then we were getting all of these resources for free. So it was this sort of win-win relationship that was created. Um, and then in the behind the scenes, they actually talk about the history of the church and um, they take us on the tour and show you some of the places. So after, at the end of the day, we ended up raising about $435,000 in in-kind resources. Um, we had about 500 volunteers. We had 27 partner organizations all in the shooting of this one film. So our, our philosophy was even if there's no film in the camera, we, everyone should still feel like this was a successful project, even if nothing got saved. And we were shooting 16 millimeter film. So we actually, after the first shoot, we actually didn't know if we, we hadn't seen any of the footage. We shot the whole thing completely blind. And then uh, it, that video actually that you saw, we cut it together um, using a little piece of the dailies um, and behind the scenes. And we, it took us eight months to raise the money to get our film out of the lab. So we actually didn't see the movie that we shot for eight months. Uh, then we raised money, then once we saw the dailies, we realized we had to do more reshooting, so we reshot again, and uh, then basically kept that process up for the next three years. So then we went into a really interesting sort of um, design aspect, and uh, is this the video? Um, I, won't, uh, I won't play the whole video, but basically, um, oh, let's see, can I mute this? I can't mute it. Um, so we ended up with doing this really cool process where we were actually, we got a grant uh, from the National Center for Institutional Diversity to finish editing the film and then we, to start a conversation, uh, a tour of, it's called Enabling Diversity Conversations. So I started touring the unfinished film to high schools and colleges and community centers, mostly around Michigan and a few in other places at, at conferences and things like that. So, um, so here we're, we're at like, this is a senior citizen's home in Detroit. Um, these are high school students at an a, a all white high school in, in like northern like Lake Town in Michigan and Petoskey. Um, and so what we actually started doing was we would show the film, uh, the rough cut, we would have questionnaires, people would watch it, they would fill out a questionnaire and we'd also ask them, what's your age, what's your race, what's your gender, what's your socioeconomic status? And we were able to actually like see which, dip, which demographics were responding to which elements of the film. And then I would go back and then I'd re-edit the film based on comments from people from different demographics. So I started noticing, oh, okay, for some reason, old white men are not getting this joke. Like, what can I do to make old white men get this joke? And then I would like re-edit the way the joke was set up and then play it again and then watch the old white men in the audience and be like, okay, now they got the joke. <laughs> and so we basically did that for about uh, almost three full years, um, screening it. Um, and this was essentially my job through my research position was screening it and we were collecting data as we were doing it. Um, and then we kept doing it until we got to a point where ba regardless of your age, race, gender, background, uh, socioeconomic status, we were pretty much getting like an 80% rating from every one of every group. And, and we would, after adjusting, and eventually actually added hand-drawn animation uh, to the film. And then to sort of, because I realized what we were doing, we were telling the story that was about a very specific subculture of like inner city youth and a lot of challenges they go through. And to stay relevant to that audience, it needs to be in the language that they speak. It needs to be um, they like in specific physical places, right? But then like there's one co character, for example, who's selling drugs, and a lot of people who are from the suburbs had no idea that that was happening because no one says like, "Do you want to buy drugs in the inner city?" He would just do little symbols like this, or he'd be like, "Yo, what's up? What you got on this?" Da da da. And then so I had I realized I had to translate those moments for people who didn't understand it, but I had to do it in a way that wasn't alienating for alienating for the people who did understand it. So. Um, so we kept adjusting and adjusting and adjusting the story. Um, trial and error. Trial, and so I added hand-drawn animation that would explain certain moments, but then we, uh, we would double them up so that there was something for each person in, in each scene. So we'd, read, we'd take a scene and we'd say, okay, how is a 16-year-old kid who's struggling and going through stuff in the inner city, how are they gonna read this scene? Okay, how is a white academic who's from a middle class background and who's studied these issues, how are they gonna read this, this scene? And then how is someone who's rural and conservative and has no idea about any of these situations, how are they gonna read these, this scene? Uh, then based on their responses, we would edit it 
play it, edit it, play it until we got to a point where their responses in the questionnaire started to move up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so we basically, like I said, we, I think I did about 45 different screenings, um, constantly editing and re-editing the film uh, the whole time. And then once I got to a point where I knew that the film was sort of working, we submitted to Sundance and we got accepted. <laughs> so, and, uh, and actually it was funny because they actually had a program called uh, Next and uh, it was for films that um, were made in new and interesting innovative ways or community-based ways and so um, so we were in the first category of the Next section uh, that year and that was a big year because John Cooper they got a new festival director that year also in 2010 and so we took, uh, we took all of, a bunch of our students, we had about 28 people staying in two condos. We organized again though and, and got the, actually the University of Michigan Alumni Association um, gave us like two cars, they helped us get one of the condos and like, support, like some of the kids drove from Detroit to Salt Lake City um, in like three caravans. Uh, it, was, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, so then I ended up going to Hollywood um, and uh, I started feeling like, okay, you know, I thought I could, could sort of make change at this higher level and um, just started to see that the, the industry, um, I like this image because I feel like it represented what I was seeing. Like the industry looks like one thing on, on the surface and then you start to see like there are these intricate ways that, it, that uh, industry plays out. So I think there's sort of three industries. There's like this nonprofit entertainment industry and they make lots of media and entertainment. There's this academic entertainment industry and they make lots of media and entertainment and people write and people get paid and people get tenure and people get published. Uh, then there's like the for-profit entertainment industry and then you know media, film, t TV, news, et cetera. And they all have their own rules, they all have their own barriers to entry and I feel like what, get lo what gets lost sometimes between them is sort of a sharing of data that might actually end up influencing larger change. So to go back to sort of where we started of inner city youth, um, I feel like that's a big issue. And so I'll speed through this. So I, I did a few more, um, more Hollywood movies. We did a film called Muslim um, based on the experiences of African-American Muslim uh, on 9-11. So it was actually my experiences. I ghost wrote it. And then my friend Qasem, who directed it, uh, and we kind of mixed our, our experiences. I was a freshman. Um, at the University of Michigan, 9-11 happens my second week of college. <laughs> so I got to college attempting to run from all things Muslim because I uh, had a lot of pain and various things associated with my faith. And then get there only to like have 9-11 happen and then I got stuck in this position of am I going to choose to acknowledge that I'm Muslim? Because as a black man I can pass in a kind of way. Like lots of black guys have weird names, nobody would read too much into it. Or I could sort of out myself by being Muslim publicly. And, uh, and that was a big struggle um, for a lot of black Muslims on campuses at that time. And so Muslim kind of goes into that and how, how you sort of deal with your past and your relationship to faith, but also in the midst of this like political context while you're at a big point changing in your life as well. Um, and then we made another feature film, same director, my, my friend Qasem, called Destined. Uh, we shot it in Detroit. Um, I felt like I was getting sort of away from my youth background and so I built in a youth program into the shooting of the film. So I'm really interested in like multi-tiered design. So what we did was instead of just shooting a normal EPK or behind the scenes, we actually shot a, we got youth from a high school in Detroit to interview the actors in like a, inside the actor studio. So we were producing a documentary that was also about these youth in Detroit and like the film's called Destined and like how our decisions shape our destiny. So we made this whole theme with the youth of like, how do the decisions you're making shape your destiny? And how do you know, the, theme, the people around you, how are the decisions they make, they're making shaping their destiny? So then we tied these thematic things with the actor interviews and then made this, uh, made this sort of secondary piece behind the film of these kids and they're hanging out with all the celebrities that are in the movie. Um, then we leveraged that piece and turned it into an actual reality show uh, called Street Cred. And so we submitted it to PBS. I got accepted to a fellowship uh, in New York through MBPC, the National Black Programming Consortium. And then uh, we um, got funded to, we, I won the pitch contest at the end of this thing and got funded for $100,000 to shoot a new TV pilot. So it was a pilot version of the youth program that I had started 10 years prior. Does that make sense? Um, in, in which you watch youth in Detroit learn entertainment producing skills and then you also watch as they make a different piece of media. 
And then, so it's a transmedia piece because there's the PBS broadcast, which hopefully will be airing this fall. There's the movie that they interned on, Destin, which comes out uh, second week of November. And then there's the webisodes of like things behind the scenes of them. And then there's actually the content that they shot. So um, that's why I'm super busy now because we have four streams of content that are all interconnected to each other um, that all roll out at different times, but around the same theme and this, this idea of like decisions shaping your destiny. And I think I have a, um, how are we on time? Wow. Okay, yeah. So this, is, this, isn't, this isn't released yet. This is, <laughs> my editor will kill me. This is not color corrected. Um, this is just the rough cut uh, of the um, sizzle reel for the show that PBS will release hopefully in the next, uh, next couple of months actually. So it's, it's one pilot episode. So PBS actually got Trump kind of threw them under the bus. Um, and a lot of people don't, even though he didn't act on his threats, it like caused a lot of internal, um, people started moving positions. Some people started getting other jobs and leaving. And so we were funded by the National Black Programming Consortium, which is a subset of CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And they basically put a freeze on all programs for like six months. So our show was initially a pilot, supposed to be a pilot episode of a reality show, which we would show to PBS and then hopefully get the funding to um, like continue doing more episodes of the show. Unfortunately, we delivered it October 8th, and then <laughs> three weeks later, we got a new president. So then like shortly after, he immediately started threatening their funding. So our whole plan kind of went, uh, sort of got thrown away. And so we now have like a one hour, it's sort of like a, a special um, of like a kind of like a proof of concept of the show. So that if we did do a full season of the show, um, which we're hoping gets funded, uh, if not through PBS, then through someone like Vice or Fusion, um, or even like maybe Sundance Channel, uh, we would have to start sort of from scratch because these kids are, um, a lot of them have moved on to different things. Secret is a new reality show that showcases the potential and the power of Detroit High School students. I was 17 years old when I had my son, so I'm here now working on me. I'm a Detroit City Rap poet, but I want to make my own film. I always kind of engaged in the past. You know, I'm kind of trying to better my life and move in a positive direction. Each week, the students are given new professional challenges producing, technical skills, pitching. Motivated young black man. You're actually going to be making a virtual reality. Next is when celebrity judges critique the projects. Don't dim your light so that somebody else can shine. And that just right. everybody like a deep level. The film industry is based on a system of credit. After each challenge, the students will earn credit. The student with the most credits at the end of the show will receive a nine week paid internship. The show is interactive, so every exercise we do in the show corresponds to a curriculum, to discussion questions, and exercises that teachers can use in the classroom, as well as youth can use around the country. We even turn the conflicts into teachable moments. That situation did get out of hand, you know what I'm saying? He saw me go back to where I came from, go back to my country. Like, Suicide bombers, and getting shot up with machine guns, or getting shot up with a piece of The fact that respect is left the minute you assume I'm gay or not gay, that's the problem. And especially as a young black woman, I've experienced a lot of alpha males like yourself who think that us as women are sexual beings. And if we do stand up for ourselves, we're looked at as too aggressive or, you know, stuck up or cocky or whatever. We can never just be, we can never just be strong. We can never just be confident. So when you came and you like that, yes, it deeply offended me because I came from the hood like you were. It was very amazing to me that the small group of people from Detroit, a lot of the things we talk about are things going on all around the world. The truth is, people don't get these opportunities as often. I feel like I saw so much progress for everybody, and for me, that feels like we we did something here, we did something that mattered, and we created an experience that was meaningful. You know, we have this narrative of hate that is happening right now in America that is absolutely devastating. And you almost see the country going backwards. You know, people are dying um, because of what they look like, or who they love. 
and Jessica Caremore. It's amazing to see that we have young people who are considering what's happening in the world and hopefully we'll change the narrative. <laughs> Come on, get in there. Let's go to the group hug. It's not just a reality show, it's a reality check. Because this is street cred. And so, um, thank you. And so, yeah, so that's that. We just finished that, and then uh, now we're um, so we we shot that show in the show that you watch the kids learn how to shoot VR, and then they actually shot their own VR. Like that's the final challenge that they have. Um, just really short 360 videos. They're ex they're like super cute. <laughs> they're one is actually they turned it. It, it worked out kind of perfectly. So this kid Jerome um, and and. We shot this pre-Trump, so this was June 2016, and then it, we finished it right before Trump. So it's really interesting because it, uh, the first time we screened it, actually for my family, um, we, it turned into a Trump conversation, but through the lens of these kids. So, and really, and it's the understanding sort of conservative values through this character, Jerome. Jay was uh, the young black man who, he got put in the same group as uh, Max, who's <laughs> totally new age, non-gender conforming. He wears makeup. He's actually has a girlfriend, but he doesn't want a label of like straight, queer, whatever. He just he rejects labels, which for Jay, who grew up on the block, was in and out of prison, he can't even fathom what that means. He has no concept. And so they, kept, they ended up in, getting put in the same group, and then Jay just lost it, and he blows up. And he's like, why don't y'all mix up these groups? Da 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 da. And then initially I was like ready to work with him because he, he was clearly out of his comfort zone. For everybody there, he was sort of, he was one who was probably the most out of his comfort zone. Um, and uh, so I'm like, okay, I, maybe I kind of went too hard. And it was, it was interesting because we're towing the line between being a TV show and a reality show at that where you want to have drama and conflict, et cetera. But these are also young people whose lives I'm trying to, to empower. And so my philosophy is if I just run it the way I run my youth program, there's enough built-in conflict and drama that you don't need to fake anything. <laughs> These are kids are like, just get a bunch of kids from Detroit and say work together and, like, and make a film. Like that is all you need to do. Um, and so then I, so I actually, we, we, what was probably would have been the most impactful um, moment, I, I uh, actually didn't, we didn't film it. Um, I felt like Jay was, uh, the cameras were in his face he was feeling some kind of way. Well, it was interesting because we went to his house um, for the like at home shoot and on the block, people read the cameras differently. So they thought like there had been an instance where somebody had like these undercover police officers like six months prior had faked like they were uh, uh, shooting a reality show about this like because there's a lot of like trap house uh, like, you know, drug dealer movie guys. So they were, said they were making a reality show about this guy and he like brought them into his whole world and they just filmed all of it and they were actually undercover cops and they like busted all of these people, yeah. So when we came to the block with Jay and the cameras, people on the block, he used to sell weed or whatever, so um, that's what he went to jail for. So people on the block are like, who are these people with cameras? Like, why are these white people coming into the, and this is, he's on the east side, like, you don't see, like there are a lot of hipster areas of Detroit, this is not one of them. Um, and so when you see a bunch of people following some kid around who you know used to be in the game, and now he's out of the game, and then he's walking around with cameras, like it created a lot of problems. So he actually wouldn't go to his house with us. And then after the first two days, he started, they started making fun of him because he's in an environment now with all these other, he was telling them, oh, there's this gay kid, there's this, you know, this other girl, there's this, this girl. And they're like, oh, you're gonna be gay, you're gonna be on TV looking gay, da da da. So he comes back on day three and he's like already feeling some kind of way because of what he's been hearing when he's going back home on the block. And that's always been an issue we've dealt with in, our, in a lot of our work. This time, I think because we were at a higher level, like we had, you know, giant professional Alexa, three cameras, Mike, you know, two audio guys, um, we, I didn't think enough about how much maintenance you need to do um, when you're and how sensitive you need to be in those communities. I, I've been, I grew up in those communities, so I'm totally comfortable there, but, um, and he was comfortable with me, but then I didn't realize the sort of other aspects of it. Um, another student, uh, um, Alex, uh, the one on the top left, um, she was homeless and she didn't tell us. And so she, we would have our transpo team go to pick her up and she would give us an address and then she would just stand outside of the house and we thought that she lived there. So um, we ended up hooking her up with a job afterwards to work on a TV show. Then I found out she got fired and I'm like, what happened? 
And, uh, and so it turned out that she was sleeping at the bus depot and going, make, trying to make set calls at like 6 a.m. So then I like track her down. I, she came, she stayed, I gave her a place to stay for a little bit. And then, so then we kind of rebooted the, the behind the scenes tracking her and Jay, um, uh, and Jay the other kid um, who blew up. And so, and really trying to like, even though it wouldn't end up in the show, but trying to see that journey through. Um, Jay, actually, I took him up to the Traverse City Film Festival, and then we ended up meeting Tony Robbins, and Tony Robbins invited us to his, like, Date with Destiny um, <laughs> event, which, which Jay is going to in, in December with my brother, actually. Um, <laughs> so I'm, we're going to ho hopefully document a little bit of that. But, um, but the project just spread, spread out in all of these ways that we had never planned. But the, most, the coolest and most recent, well, actually, to, to back up a little bit, so one of the things that we wanted to do was we were essentially hacking like two different genres um, to make like a triple blended genre project. So we wanted to do a docu series, and we had been I had been pitching this is, I had been pitching this for ten years. So this is year ten of pitching. No one ever wanted to was interested in a docu series about inner city kids learning how to make a film. So then I was like, well, what if we set it up as a reality show? And even though they're not getting like eliminated or anything, it's still structured and edited like a reality show. But I was like, but I don't want it to turn into like love and hip hop or something like that. So we went a level further and we were like, kids, you know, now they watch Twitch, they watch all of these, there's all this sort of gaming culture where they're watching things play out and people playing games as they, and watching people play games. So I was like, so what if we add in like a video game interface to the reality show motif so that you're, you're actually, it's like a Twitch, you're like watching Twitch, except there are real people and the things that they're competing with each other are actually personal development things. And so, because we wanted to make something that would be interesting, again, to go back to Bilal saying, interesting for like a white academic, interesting for a kid in the inner city, interesting for a kid from rural area who didn't understand the inner city at all. So we were able to use this video game interface to like break down different moments. So the kids have these cred bars, and then each time they have a moment, like when Jillian kind of goes off and she's like, as a black woman, I da da da. And so as she's talking, her cred bar is starting to go up. And then when Jerome is being closed-minded, his cred bar starts going down. But then later he comes back and apologizes, and his cred bar starts going back up. And then after each of their challenges, they, um, you know, we go to like the leaderboard, and then we see who has the most cred and who's sort of progressing the farthest. But then we we turned it on its head a little bit. So Alex, she actually tries to sing a pitch. And she's on stage at the Michigan Theater, which is a huge theater, and she tries to sing her pitch, and it totally fails. It just bombs. It just, she gets nervous. It doesn't work. But she actually got the most cred for that experience because she tried to do something that was like so far out of her comfort zone. So, um, so our, our goal with the larger show is that this would be a full season, and then um, we would, you know, you would see the progress of these kids over like eight to twelve weeks. Um, the challenges are all like, like there's a mindset challenge. So we sort of dramatized the, in the way that normal reality shows do, except we put a context of personal development behind the dramatization. There's also, it connects to an interactive platform. So teachers can actually go online and download content that has to do with the, um, what they see. So there's a, a how to shoot 360 video. There's like how to facilitate dialogue about homophobia when you're working with youth. Um, and a few other like pieces. We didn't create all of that content. Some of it is just stuff that we're referring people to, but using the, the show as a means to do that. So then after that, we got a grant from a group, um, Allied Media Projects, uh, at, to shoot another 360 video. This gets meta, 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 okay? So, <laughs> so, um, we, so in the show, you watch the kids, go through the process and they learn how to shoot 360 video. So then I hire them at the end of the show. It's like, you've all been hired to work this thing. So we hired them, I was able to get the city to pay them so they could all get paid to be like my interns. So as my interns, we, we all embark on this 360 video project where we're gonna shoot a virtual reality narrative, but we're gonna build a new economic distribution model while we're shooting the virtual reality narrative. So, um, and it's, a, it's an immersive piece uh, similar to like or inspired by um, Sleep No More in New York, if you've seen that. It's like the Macbeth play, you kind of walk through a theater. So the, the model for it actually doesn't exist in three, a few different levels, so I'll try to explain it clearly. So it starts off with, this, um, with a model where like any high school or organization can actually put this 
event on. So it's like a Ventize 360 video. So in the same way that like a ride at Universal Studios or, um, you know, Back to the Future, Transformers, King Kong, like those types of rides. So an organization will put on the event, it starts with a play, and then there's a hologram, which we're actually building right now, and they come out and they say, you know, we're the Boston Youth Organization, and we found this transmission that was sent back from the future. And then they show you the transmission, it's the year 2072, and they, they're future casting, which is an exercise we do with our kids, and uh, they basically say, you know, Facebook merged with Google and Amazon and Twitter and Snapchat, and it's all controlling all of your media, and it drives your car, and it, like, it has bio data that, like, tracks you wherever you go, and so, um, and so they're like, we realized that if people didn't start a resistance, like an alternative media network in the year 2020, then it's going to be too late. So we, they figured out a way to send a memory back from the future to the past to, in the hopes of inspiring people to start this, rev, this media revolution earlier. So this group comes out and they say, we found this capsule and in it contained this memory that was sent back from this woman in the future, uh, these two sisters who are... Um, sort of like global change leaders in the future and they tried to lead this rebellion of like getting people to unplug, but there weren't enough people um, and they were trying to blow up the servers of the giant entity, um, AFCAP, and, uh, and they couldn't do it. And so on their last hurrah, they saved the memory and, and from her and they asked her as she's dying, like what memory could we send back that would inspire people to like create change in the past? And she says, send back a memory of the day when it all changed. So this happens as a half performance, half hologram with a live group playing themselves, but in character, um, addressing a hologram that they've received. So it's kind of like that, help me Obi-Wan, you're my only hope moment with R2-D2. It's like that as a performance. Then they sit you down and they say, they, they taught us how to build these headsets, taking a headset, and then they put you into, um, into the 360 video. So it's, but it's actually a hackable version. So what we're gonna do is release an unedited an un unfinalized version where they can insert themselves into the narrative of the video. So it starts with this like guided meditation. And so whoever is your speaker, they can actually record their own audio. We'll, we're gonna give people the, they're gonna have to go through a whole online class to learn how to do this program. But then we give them the audio and then they can embed the audio. So it goes from like someone talking physically to like you put on the headphones and you hear the same person talking that you just saw talking to you, but in the video that is the memory that got sent back from the future. Um, so you, uh, it kind of is it's spacey, 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 and then um, eventually you wake up. So um, again, we did our same model. We were able to get like a $40,000 worth of uh, 360 video equipment uh, for free um, because we're doing something that actually has never been done. So we're on, underneath the digital play is a physical play. So the same group that's hosting an organization, when, um, like for example, when your sister, uh, so this is Jillian, and she, she plays her, her, your sister, but she also plays you, because um, they're twins, Nia and Eve. And so she's gonna lean in and hug you. So there's actually, a, or, there's an actor who's playing her, who's gonna physically lean in and hug you in time with her hugging you. Um, and so what it does is it creates this it uses the digital space to create this level of intimacy. Like you are inside this young black girl's body, like inside her bedroom with her sister. And then your dad comes in, and unfortunately I had to be dad uh, because our actors, <laughs> our actors didn't show up. But this is one of my favorite scenes. This is rock and roll and stuff is no <laughs> they make fun of me. <laughs> um, but it's this like funny little moment where uh, so you're, touching the you're touching them. Yeah, you're like caressing your daughter's neck. And it's cool because we did this actually for Sundance. Um, and, and everybody, even Trevor Groth, who's one of the head programmers at Sundance, it was really funny because they're like, it's this weird moment of intimacy where you have a black man who's your father who's, and you're like short, so he's standing over you and he's caressing you and patting your head and telling you like how proud he, uh, he is of the work that you're doing for this project uh, that, you're, uh, that you're doing. I think your laptop might have died, uh, Josefina, but that's okay. So, the, um, so you go through this whole day inside this girl's body and, uh, and it, um, you, every, every person that you encounter, you, you hang out with her friends, you go into a dance class and learn this like compassion dance that is sort of like Captain Planet mixed with Avatar The Last Airbender. What are the politics about getting into her life? I mean, is, she's a fic is she a real character or a fictional character? 
She's a fictional character. So uh, she's a fictional character who's a, 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 but she's also this, actually it's interesting. So we, uh, we're, we're, she's this character that everyone can add to. So she, so your group can customize her to be like, can. And who's your audience? So the, it's, it's sort of two parts. So the idea is that sort of social justice organizations or social impact groups or college groups or high schools, they're the ones putting the event on. But in a way, the audience is also like, people they might invite from their communities mm -hmm. who might actually be like conservative or who might not be, um, I think people could benefit the most from this type of experience, um, would be people who aren't familiar with this type of world or space. Um, so the goal is to actually facilitate, use it as a dialogue piece, it's ultimately just a dialogue piece, mm -hmm. to create a, to a sort of interesting gamified way to pull people into having social justice dialogues that might not normally engage with those types of dialogues. So the narrative is that she, you're, you, <laughs> Eve, have like sort of naively invited, um, have invited all of these like rival groups in your community. She invited the East Side crew, the West Side boys. She invited this racist high school that was chanting like build the wall, build the wall, which happened in Michigan. <laughs> and, uh, and then she also invited the police, right? And then, and she didn't tell any of them that she had invited the other groups. She told them that they were gonna be there themselves just to do a piece, um, sort of like learn this piece, this compassion dance. So then you actually go into a dance class, um, and this is Jessica Caremore, who is also in the show Street Cred, and she's a Def Jam poet, spoken word artist, um, a community leader, leader, community healer. So we cast her to basically play herself, <laughs> a version of herself uh, in the thing. So she teaches you this compassion dance that we came up with with our students and under the guidance of different like spiritual leaders and spiritual healer, healers. Um, and it kind of it pulls from different traditions, um, Native, tra Native American traditions, uh, African traditions from Zimbabwe, uh, one of our a martial arts master we worked with from uh, Japan. Um, and it sort of builds this sort of circle dance with all of them. So what we're actually working on now is as you do the dance, so this is all, you, again, your perspective, you start creating like emitting waves and then these like waves of energy start going out and affecting the people around you. Then the end, it actually gets a little controversial. So at the end, she's invited all these groups. They all you know show up, and this is all unedited. This is actually like these are literally our raw dailies, but um, it looks not, it doesn't look too bad. So she's and she's like holding your hand. So the act, uh, we got to paint that out, but like an actor is basically holding your hand, walking you. These are all my kids um, at, at school, uh, and they pretty much scripted most of, of this this part. Um, and then uh, then like this big fight breaks out, and then like the police now are getting involved, and then you kind of like your sister serves as sort of a she kind of pulls your eye around. That's the high school kids. These people start arguing, there's lots of yelling. It kind of gets really crazy. Um, and, then, uh, and then slowly, like you and your cousin, Tay, uh, I don't know what I did. You start to do the, um, you start to essentially do the, the compassion dance. So then it sort of infects everyone around you. And, uh, and then you start to see like the visual effects coming into play as well. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're, uh, working on now it's sort of the culmination of a lot of the the previous work that we've done and uh it's also building a network so the idea is that at the end of the experience people can download the app that we're building and then they can join the group is called the real existence and they join the real existence after they do the experience so you know ultimately it'd be something that like a campus group here might do or a high school might do and then there's a whole dialogue about the film and what comes up in the film and the issues that it raises and then groups can actually customize that dialogue as well and uh, but ultimately we're trying to build an alternative network so that social justice groups from around the country can work together organizing um, and using sort of media as an organizing tool yeah and that's uh that's it. That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> I'm actually working on two do other documentaries, but I didn't want to talk about them. <laughs> Rake, Rake of a yellow. Um, any questions? How do you do it all? Huh? How do you read all the stuff you throw out here? 
I um so I actually think there's a and this I will talk about this next week. I, I it might be what I'm focusing my thesis on. I think there's a new way to approach design that's a type of meta design where if you if you step back enough and look at the system of something, you can see enough overlap. Like the whole process might not overlap, but there are moments of process that overlap. And so if you combine them so that you're essentially doing two things at once, right? So like I got a fellow yeah, it totally saves time. It's like, they call it NET, no extra time. And, uh, and so I try to design things that are almost predominantly NET. So like even the readings, like you guys are giving us readings and I'm turning around and saving those and adding them to the script of, <laughs> like I'm saving quotations from the reading and adding them to the script that are, as the content or curriculum that the organizations that put on these events can pull from. So when we read about like, uh, like actually, like the Fisk reading we had recently for Lisa's class, um, one of the border readings that we had earlier for, for uh, your class, like, and I'm putting them into, making them a part of the narrative of the digital revolution that these people are starting. So, um, and then I actually have a, a really great team. I have five interns at the University of Michigan who are editing right now. I have an assistant editor, um, a business manager, and uh, another LA business manager who manages a lot of the VR stuff. And then, and then we just got a grant, a um, uh, decent sized grant, which will allow us to actually hire somebody full time. For the, so to, to actually finish workshopping this as, with a, as a tour, the 360 video. So it's gonna become a tour with high schools around the country. And then we're building an app that, uh, it's hard to describe. It's, it's like an Instagram filter, but like, so in the thing you learn is compassion dance, which is kind of like airbending, airbending, waterbending, like shooting fireballs in water things out of your body. And so you can, if you were staging a protest of something and people learn the compassion dance, you can hold up your phone and using this like AR filter that you can turn them into sort of digital superheroes by put it, holding the filter over them as they like shoot fireballs at people that are committing injustices. <laughs> so we're, uh, but we're, so we're trying to create financial models as we do that as well. So I, I started doing a type of uh, mapping and this is what we did with our first project. So with my first film, we actually, we went to Sundance. We, I thought we'd get sold. We, no one wanted to touch the film because it's an all black cast with no celebrities. So I'm happy to talk about distribution if you'd like. And so because I had already been screening the film, I knew that people liked it. So I just used the same process I had been using to screen the film through my research fellowship at the Center for Institutional Diversity to create a new, essentially a new like educational distribution model for the film. So we actually ended up doing about 175 screenings in 55 cities over the course of three years. So for three years, I didn't do anything but travel around the country and show my movie and while I was writing, writing a new movie. So, um, so it kind of starts, if you look at the top of this, uh, these are all the, board, the organizations I'm a part of. This is the Magic Wand Foundation. Um, it's a youth, inter international youth camp with uh, probably about a thousand alumni of kids from around the world um, from about 32 different countries who are all like young entrepreneurs. So I've been working with that organization for about seven years. I'm a board member at the Michigan Theater, which is the largest art house theater and we run a network of 400 or, or 500 other art house theaters, right? So, and everyone kind of knows me in that network as a sort of diversity police. So, um, so I'm connected to that. I teach, I've taught occasionally at the University of Michigan and in their screen arts and cultures department and through my students who are at the University of Michigan, we're accessing that network. Um, and the mo most people, a lot of people in those realms know me because of Bilal Stan. Uh, PBS, CPB, and MBPC, which are our funders for the show Street Cred. Um, Allied Media Foundation who funded the, um, the short, the VR shoot itself, um, and they are a network of uh, social justice organizations from around the country. Um, Sundance Ignite is a program I mentor for, and we actually have some support from the Sundance Institute, uh, then through our YouTube channel. So the idea is that you have all of these, you've made partners with all these organizations, and they are, it's in their interest for this project to get out because it's a part of their fun, sort of funding directives, right? They wanna, so they all support the street cred pilot. Then we have a curriculum, a production curriculum, the When It All Changes VR, we have celebrity partners that we've been building up, and uh, then webisodes. So then each of these then fracture and create a wider network, and they're inspired by these initial networks. So then when you, uh, sorry, when you fracture further, um, you get to this layer here, this white layer, and then you start to actionize your networks. So the Art House Convergence Network, which is um, you know 25 indie theaters, and you have uh, PBS Learning Media, who has 2 million downloads in schools. You have um, 
a national association of uh, entrepreneur network um, from the Magic Wand Foundation. We have youth audiences. We have national media justice organizations from around the country. VR networks from the VR partner. Like we shot, we got funded by um, a group that uh, Nokia Ozo essentially. Um, and then national youth programs, the Indie Buzz. So we start looking at all of these networks and if you put them into action, you get to about 5 million people that you're already connected through just through the interactive or through the strategic partnerships you've built into the project. So if you design the project in a way where everybody can make the project their own, and we actually put in a fundraising model, so you can use our video as a fundraiser. So you download the, the pack, say you pay $1,000 for it, you can actually charge admission, because it's like a ride at uh, um, Universal Studios, so you can charge admission for 20 bucks. If you pay people like 10 bucks or, or, or 10 to 12 bucks an hour, you can actually make like five grand a day doing this VR show in your community. So ideally it's something that like, um, and then we get a part of the residual, residuals that come back up to our organization. So you can be hosting at a little community center in Detroit or Iowa or Kentucky, whatever. You can be hosting this thing and you're spreading the message about the thing while you're hosting the event because you're getting people to sign up for the app at the end of the discussion you have. But it's building our network where we're getting more and more partners that are feeding into the profit model of building a network. And that's the whole point of the piece that they just went through of being in somebody's body from the future was to try to build an alternative network. So it's, it's sort of, in, um, and then ideally we would have a phase two, which would be a next episode, which we would actually crowdsource. So we wouldn't come up with the episode ourselves. We'd say, based on what happened with the first rendition of this, we'd write a new narrative that maybe some organization in like New Mexico does, and it's about immigration, and it's another memory that got sent back from the future. Then we incorporate what we did in this version and that version. So they'd say, you know, the Real Existence got started in 2019, and, and they, did, they did 150 organizations partnered, and this many people saw the experience, and this many people downloaded the app, and it changed the future, and now we need to do X to change the future again to do blah, 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 blah. So then that becomes episode two, and then you keep rolling out different episodes as people are building this actual on the ground organization that's tied to a financial model. Does that make sense? So the idea is like if you start building in all of these sort of advocates for your group, then it just would expand and expand and expand. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's kind of actually a similar thing that what happened with the, uh, the um, Ice Bucket Challenge, um, but it's, just, it's trying to basically like make a formula for how to recreate that type of momentum and financial activity actually. And anybody could do this. Like if you sat down and really thought through your networks and connections, like a lot of people are actually much closer to different, you know, people than they than they could possibly think. And so as you start to share your vision, like now you all know the vision and you're a part of the diagram and like you might be like, hey, you so you should talk to so and so. They're doing work just like this. So you should talk to this group and or, or you meet someone later and you're like, I saw this person and they were doing this presentation and it was just like da da da. And so I've learned to trust in those alternative networks because I feel like if we can learn to harness them, like that's the best way that we can challenge the mainstream network, which to go all the way back to my first goal, I think that's the only way that we're gonna make real change in the inner city is to start to create a cultural shift. And I don't think it's realistic to expect it to come from the system as is, like it has to come from the people. But we have the power to do that, we just all look to the system to create change instead of recognizing like we could tap into our own power and make our own change and change our own narrative. And so, um, so this is an attempt to do that through a sustainable for-profit app-driven virtual reality way. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this is all, this has all been the same design process. So essentially I've been in like a 15 year or really like a 20 year design process. Like since I was 13 and went through all of that stuff, I've constantly been asking the question of like, what would, cha what would create change? Like what would create change? Like how could you create change? And then every time I got to a new stage and analyzed that system, then I was like, okay, this system is a part of the larger system in these ways, but you'd have to do these things to create change. So it's always been the same driving question, I think for me. And that's why I think I've, I've always came back to working with kids because when you're with them and around them, like you feel their, their energy and the realness of their world. And, um, and so I think if you can stay true to that and remember, for me, I feel like if I can remember that, if I can remember when I was in that place, then it helps me to keep designing in a way that is true to like my experiences. 
Any other questions? I just talked for a lot, a long time. <laughs> that was uh, awesome. <laughs> when you went, that was it the documentary project where you had um, people from the University of Michigan and people from the community all working together. Mm -hmm. um, I know when at Blackside they had the model where each episode was uh, a white producer and a black producer working together, mm -hmm. and there was often a lot of tension that came up from mm -hmm. that just because they had different perspectives. But that was mm -hmm. part of the process. And I was wondering if that, you know, if that uh, came into play in the process when you had all these people from different classes and um, perspectives and whether you had to deal with that or wh whether you worked with that, I guess. We did, um, although we designed, um, we sort of designed specifically because of that. So my first film uh, that I shot before Bilal Stan, uh, we were, it was set in Detroit, um, you know, sort of traditional, like, it was like risky business meets the girl next door. That was the pitch for it. And, uh, this kid from the suburbs meets this prostitute in the city and she gets him in all kinds of trouble. So, um, so we, long, long, long story short, because it was a crazy experience. I was 20, like, with a, way too much money for a kid um, <laughs> that age, but uh, trying to make a movie. And um, we shot the movie, 35 millimeter feature film. It was an amazing experience. But we kept having these experiences where in that summer the Pistons actually had made it to the finals. And so our predominantly white university crew like would refuse to go to certain neighborhoods in these areas. So we're standing outside with a giant grip truck and like, you know, thousands of dollars of equipment and like everybody had their stories. So people would protest and they would not come to set to some shoots because they're like, I'm not going to that neighborhood. I'm not going to that neighborhood. Um, we don't have security, like da da da. And so, um, so initially, I responded really negatively towards it. And then, uh, then I just started telling them, okay, this is where we're shooting. If you aren't gonna show up, you aren't gonna show up. What ended up happening the first day that that happened where like, I'd say two thirds of the crew didn't show up um, to the shoot. Uh, we get there and no joke, there were like little kids playing in the fire hydrant <laughs> like the, and like in their bathing suits right at the spot where it was like Chase picks up a prostitute was the subject line of that scene, you know, exterior abandoned factory, Chase picks up prostitute. And then, and so we got there and I kind of had this moment of like, who are, who am I to like come back to the space when I used to be one of those kids and now I'm coming back with this level of privilege from all, you know, and representing this entity and we've determined that this is what this space is. Um, and this, you know, this is what happens here is prostitutes get picked up and our crew refused to come because they didn't want to shoot at this building. And we turn up and like, this is where kids play, this is their playground. And so that actually became the first shot of Bilal's stand as you pan down that same building and there's kids playing in the playground. And so we specifically designed our program because of experiences like that. So when we started, we would do, um, the kids would interview each other and we do a lot of like, sort of layers and layers of icebreak, icebreakers. Um, we would also put them in the scene. So one of my favorite moments uh, in that first little doc, short doc, uh, the, the students, the U of M students had to direct the high school students as actors, and then we reversed their roles, and the high school students had to be directors, and the U of M students had to be actors. And, and they're all performing the scene that's about race and class. Yeah. <laughs> this girl is pregnant and, and a bunch of stuff is happening. And so then they would have to talk about it afterwards and what it felt like to direct the scene and what it felt like to be in the scene. Right. So and, yeah, was... and yeah, so we, we had lots of moments where we would, you, and then like from that experience, like real world experiences would start to, to get flushed out. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, so we, we did all of that. That's why we did that for six weeks before we even started shooting. The actual piece. So by the time we got to shooting, they all were like, yeah. they had they had so many, yeah, and they had little narratives, and we still had some issues. There's one person we t asked not to come back, one of the U of M students, because he just kept making comments. This spoiled, his spoiled rich kid, <laughs> and just just couldn't. He was uncomfortable, and we were trying to make him more comfortable, and he kept trying a little too hard and in the wrong ways to like create a, a comfort space for him. And it was, it got to the point where it became like toxic. And so we just asked him not to come back. But, um, but other than that, every, I think for most people, at least at that point, were so, it was so different. Like people were coming, people would see us shooting and they would just start coming out of houses. And they would be like, what's happening? Like, 
who are these white people? Why are they in our neighborhood? <laughs> like, what is going on? And we had someone whose job was, luckily my producer was also a social work student. So, uh, and actually I guess that's probably the best answer to that question. Yeah. Our producer was a social worker. Okay. And so, yeah. um, so she built in like community facilitation yeah. things and like, and, so, and we had people whose job it was, was to greet people from the, like, hey, hi, we're in your neighborhood because of this and we're in your space because of this. Here are, re here's a research sheet of, you know, someone who's experiencing homelessness, if you know someone Someone who's experiencing abuse like she had a, a sheet with all the resources in the area of wherever we were shooting so instead of just having like a location contact form she would come out and be like oh here's other resources and here's how you can connect and if you're interested in media here are youth programs that teach media and so people would be so surprised to engage like that they end up they call their friends and they'd be like come be an extra in this movie and then it would just grow from there um, a few people have in different ways um, I don't know that it's been done in any, any like formal way. There's a really great program called the Ghetto Film School um, out of New York, and then they just opened uh, up last year in LA as well. And, um, and they have like a, a similar, sort of similar program. They don't make, our focus is on making like feature sellable content. So we're making feature films that can go to theaters and, and allowing the youth to sort of participate in a very active way in that process. So there's a lot of risk factors involved in that. There's a lot of um, insurance. Honestly, it's, it becomes like an insurance thing. Sometimes it becomes a union thing, um, if, if, depending on what types of equipment. We're usually at like a $1 million budget range, so we're under the union radar, um, at least in Michigan. Um, so they, they kind of leave us alone, um, and they kind of know me and know I do youth stuff, so we're able to skirt around it. But I think for a norm, like if you were trying to do this in LA, you'd run into a ton of union issues. I'm able to broker U of M, so U of M has their own general counsel, and I like did research on how legal works at the university. So because all of the students are registered in classes and they're under an outreach thing, there's another outreach clause that covers insurance for young people. So we were able to like leverage the university's insurance policy and their coverage norms for classes and outreach, and then blanket that on top of the film. So we actually didn't get traditional film insurance, we got university insurance that extended to a film. Um, and they had to build out a completely new model for us because no one had ever done it before. I've burned a lot of bridges actually with a lot of friends because I have always very clearly seen this vision and this methodology. Yeah, but I think a lot of times it's, um, there are various conflicts in the way that programs are designed and I think that, uh, or the boundaries, right? So I had to learn about general counsels and insurance and like all of this stuff because initially people would be like, you can't do that, we don't do that. And like, I'm just really stubborn and, and hard headed. And, and, uh, and I'm like, I, that's not an acceptable, I would tell people, I look them in the eye and be like, that's not an acceptable response. Like no one has done this before, I accept that, but like that's who I am in life is I do stuff that no one's done before. So figure out a way for us to be able to do this. And, then, uh, and if you can't do it, like, I mean, I would get, it would be like, heartfelt and there'd be tears, <laughs> there'd be a lecture like, when I was 13. <laughs> um, I actually like that became a part of our process too, because it was something that I learned. So I taught my students how to do that. And you know, when you're navigating these spaces and the first time it happened totally organically, like I was trying to produce a film and we needed to shoot in the botanical gardens, which was illegal. And then, um, and I had just, I was really stressed and a lot was going on. And my brother was in prison actually at the time. Uh, and so it's really weird because I'm on, in college on the campus and like, you're visiting your brother in prison and like coming back to college and people say, where were you this weekend? And it's like, you, you don't even want to talk about it. And um, so I was producing a film and it was, a bunch of stuff was happening. And, uh, and I kind of like had a mini meltdown like at the botanical gardens because we needed to use this location. And I was just like, I am giving everything I got. <laughs> <laughs> like it's this very Will Smith esque like criteria, and then she was like, "You can shoot, you can shoot, you can do it." <laughs> like, you can. She's like, "Anything you need, just don't tell our boss, and it'll be okay." And then like I was like, "Huh, interesting. <laughs> that worked." Methodology. Yeah, and then so then I like started doing it. Then we actually te I teach my students how to. I mean, it's not specifically that. It's more explaining like where I grew, where you grew up, and like under giving people a sort of mini lesson in a cultural context, yeah. but getting them to understand how they can be an enabler towards social change, even in the position that they are in. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it ends up being like, you, yeah, you're the receptionist at the Botanical Gardens, but like in this moment, like you can be this person who's gonna enable us to like create the story. And this is what we're trying to accomplish. And you are now part of what we're trying to accomplish because you can either choose to say yes, or you can choose to say yeah. no, or choose to not care. Yeah. Uh, then it kind of puts the onus on them to like participate or not 
but like lets them, it does it in an inviting way. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so we've made that also a part of my methodology. So all my students have, that's their first assignment is how to give a pitch. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys. Yeah. Amazing.